Many years ago, I, I was in Bible college and I took a class um, on homiletics. You know, I had to take a lot of classes on hermeneutics, which is the interpretation of the Bible, how to read it in context, the Greek and the Hebrew and all of that. But I took a class, Professor Brody, on homiletics, which is the skill and the art, if you would, or the manner in which you are to be a proclaimer of the Word of God, preaching. It's a class on preaching. And there are three styles of preaching that people can do. They can grab a topic. Let's talk about the love of God, or let's talk about joy or, or peace. And then you go through and you find verses that apply to that, Old Testament, New Testament, and you lay out the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, the love of the Lord, whatever that topic is. Great way to do it. If you know me, I'm not very good at that. I only do that on holidays, like next week with Mother's Day. I'll do a message on mothers. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? <laughs> you know, or Fourth of July or something like that. Um, the second way to do that, and the reason why I don't do topical very often is because you kind of run out of things to talk about, or you don't run out of things to talk about, and you just go for things that is on your mind and what you think the Lord's laying on you, but you don't cover all of the Word of God. I've talked to preachers who only te- preach topically, and they have never preached out of particular passages of Scripture. Not once. Well, I get it. So I chose many, many years ago to go with one of the two latter forms. First is topical. Second is textual. You take a text in the Bible, and you look at that text, and you preach from that text. And you might grab verses here and there to support the points of that text, and that's really where I land. The third is expository, where you go verse by verse by verse. And we don't do that, but you cover all of the text with the textual. But verse by verse is just analysis, like reading a commentary. Well, I do textual, and because of that, and my desire to go through the entire Word of God with you every 10 years... We're going to cover a passage of Scripture. And uh, sometimes that's a whole lot of fun. There are other days like today where it's kind of like the short straw, and you come across a passage that you have to deal with, and you don't really want to. But we're going to. So that's where we're at today. You love that lead? It was awesome, right? It says, oh boy, here we go. Here Here comes Foster. We're in Exodus. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've been fed by God and ministered to by God with water, and they've been led by God, and they're on their way to Sinai, and they're out in the wilderness of Zin, and uh, God has shown himself in the journey, and they get attacked by the Amalekites. And so we're looking at this army, these people today, And so the title of the message is the Amalekites winning the battle with the priest and with purity. How do you win your battles? The battles of your life, the things you're going through. What's the manner in which you walk through the struggles of your life? The text today will point to a way to do so in allowing God to fight your battles, knowing that the priesthood of Christ is sufficient to gain victory for you, and he's calling you to walk in purity as he's made you holy. Let's look first, chapter 17, verse 1. It says, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord. You could probably preach a sermon on that. Because yes, it's called sin, later it's called zin. That's the name of the place. It has no significance to the fact that we're falling short of the glory of God. But just by a word play, you can say, are you moving through the wilderness of your sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord? I'm not preaching that sermon today, but it is of interest. But here we go in verses 8 through 13 that gives you the gist of what is going on as they are walking towards Sinai in this wilderness stage by stage. Then Amalek, or Amalek, came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him, and he fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. 
Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. There's an attack. They've just left Egypt. They're tired. They're worn out. They are being fed. They are watered. They have quail. But they're weary. And they're hit by an army. And as long as the hands are lifted with God's presence over them, they had victory. Now, Aaron is the high priest. Aaron is holding one hand up, and he is the priesthood of God holding up one arm. Her name means purity. So he's been selected. Joshua's fighting the battle. Moses is going before the Lord. Aaron is representing the priesthood of God. And her is representing purity of the people by God's grace. And as long as that was going on, victory happened. Let's read on in verses 14 through 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book, recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I'll utter, utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We can take a look at Deuteronomy in the second rehearsing of the law. And it says in chapter 25, God is giving you for an inheritance to possess so that you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven you shall not forget. We can jump forward in the time of Saul in 1 Samuel when God tells Saul to go out and do battle. He says, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Did you hear that? That's not an easy read. Kill them all. Block them out of history. This is one of the things that the world wants to say to you. How can you serve a God that recommends the killing of an entire people group, including infants? That scares a lot of Christians when that question comes up, but it comes up a lot. How can you follow a God that will send people to hell? How can you follow a God that makes people knowing they go to hell? How can you follow a God, yada yada, who is so harsh and destructive and brutal? How can you follow this God of the Old Testament? We only want to look at Jesus, the loving Savior, and we like the picture of Jesus, but how can you follow that God? Anybody heard it? It's all over the place. Well, who's this dude? Who's Amalek? Why has he brought such rage from the heart of God against not only him, but every descendant he will ever have from generation to generation? Well, we know from the scripture in Genesis that, well, he's the grandson of Esau, Jacob's brother. Esau was the firstborn. He deserved and was going to get the birthright of all the blessings and the blessings of the father. And he would get a larger portion of inheritance and he would be the leader of the tribe and all of that. But he despised that. And because he was hungry and thought about a meal more than his own sustenance, more than what God would give him as a birthright, he sold it to his brother. He despised the things of God. 
to the point that God says, Jacob, I love and Esau, I hate. Esau despises all that is sacred, all that is holy. Though his mother wishes him not to, he marries an Ishmaelite. Marries outside of the tribe to the people who don't worship God. He doesn't care about the things of God. And he has a grandson. Grandson is born. He's a tribe of unto himself, and it's just on the southwest portion, just below Gaza. Scripture says in Genesis, he's the son of a concubine. He has no birthright himself. He has no blessing himself. And I just wonder if he holds a grudge that here he is out in the wilderness with no blessing, no birthright, saying, if my grandfather had gotten the blessing, this would be a different story for me. But he despises the things of God. The Bible says in Numbers 24 that the Amalekites became first among the nations. That's an interesting point. This young guy, the son of a concubine, cast out, no blessing, no birthright, becomes a warrior and a warrior people of nomads that take over and do battle all around Sinai and all around the Saudi Peninsula to the point that all of his, you talk about Midianites, Edomites, all of those are subservient to this Amalekite regime, mini kingdom if you will. Number says, then he looked on Amalek and took up his discourse and said, Amalek was the first among nations and his end, his utter destruction. Now, who are these people in history? And you'll have to bear with me because June and I talk about this all the time and I get so history deep into it that we, I might lose you. So if there are pillows, we're going to pass those out right now. The Amalekites are the Hyksos. If you take a look at the Hyksos, they reigned in Egypt as foreign kings for about 400 years. Several dynasties of Egypt were the Amalekites or the Hyksos. That word means foreign kings. It could mean shepherd kings. They're ruler of a foreign land. They're broken down into two sections. The early Hyksos sojourn from 1706 to 1491, if you would was ruled by, and you can look at history on this, and there's so many great documents on this, by an individual named Yaqub Har, or Jacob. He's a ruler of the early Hyksos reign. We know that Jacob was a powerful nation, and when the famine took place and Joseph was sold into slavery... Jacob and his sons and those who followed him, a very powerful number of people, would come down and they were in the land of Goshen. Joseph became second unknown to Pharaoh. And over the course of time, this delta region, lower Nile, became ruled with the multiplication of these Israelites, Jacobites, to the point that history says they were governors. And the Pharaoh actually ruled from Thebes and had given up governorship of the entire delta to these Jews. History says that the Hyksos were leaving to a degree about 1446 B.C. Well, guess who comes in also is the second reign of Hyksos, of foreign rulers. And they are the Amalekites. Within months, you see these individuals who attack Israel at their weakest moment pass on and they come in and they take over this vacancy because the Pharaoh's army is depleted and they set up a reign for another 250 to 300 years of the Amalekite reign. And you can take a look at towns, Saudi Arabia, in Sinai Peninsula, even in Israel, that there were strongholds that were ruled by governors who were assigned by the Hyksos or the Amalekites. They were, they were like Egypt. They were like Babylon. 
They ruled the region. That's an interesting thing to me to discover history and these individuals and how they operate. Well, how about the Amalekites in the Bible? We see them here at Rephidim, and this really is the beginning of God's hatred of them. But let's listen to why God is so upset with them. Well, he, he says about them, how he attacked you on the way. This is Deuteronomy 25. It's not up on the screen. But it says, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. He hits the weak. He hits those who are stragglers. He hits you when you're down. He hits you when you're tired, and he has no fear of God. The nations had heard about what had happened in the Red Sea. There was fear. Who are these people whose God is God and would do this to the, the most powerful nation of Egypt? Malachites didn't care. Just like Esau, they didn't give a... He didn't care at all about the things of God or the reverence of God, and they hit them when they were weak. We see them months later after the spies cross over into the Jordan and they look around and they come back and two of them say, we can take this, God's for us. And ten of them says, we can't do this. And so the people say, we're not going to go in. Of course, God judges them. They go 40 years in the wilderness. All the grown-ups die because of their disobedience. But before they go, they say, you know what? We're not going to go in there, but let's hit these Amalekites who hit us a couple of months ago. Let's go ahead and take them on. And they tried, and God said, do not fight them. Do not take them on right now. And they disobeyed. They went in there and fought the Amalekites, and they got their tails white. Unsanctioned battle by God. You say, well, hey, we're going to kill these guys. They, they attacked us when we're weak. We're going to strike back. Not unless the Lord says. We move forward in the time of the judges. Many of the judges took on the Amalekites. Ehud took on Eglon. The king of Moab, who collected forces of the Amalekites and the Ammonites and tried to defeat Israel. We see Gideon fighting them. We see the song of Deborah and how they fought the Amalekites in the valleys. They're all over the place, these Amalekites. Move to the time of Saul. According to 1 Samuel 14, the king had fought this enemy. And the Amalekites were coming and wiping out crops and all this and trying to starve out the people of Israel. And God says, I'm done with them. Go in there, fight them. And we refer to the verse I mentioned earlier, kill them all. Kill them all. But Saul didn't do that. He let the king live. Some of the choicest cattle live. And because of it, God took Saul out of his king and kingdom and put David in. So Samuel had to go and kill Agog. But not all the Amalekites were dead. God said, do it. They didn't do it. We can go further on in history, in biblical history, in the time of Hezekiah. There's a remnant of these still living around Mount Seir and Edom. And the last time we see the Amalekites is in the book of Esther. A man named Haman who went and devised a scheme to completely wipe out every single Jew in existence. But it hadn't been Esther going before Xerxes and saying, spare my people. And they got to turn around and fight back. And Haman got his. <laughs> you see, if you don't take them out, they keep coming at you. They keep ripping you when you're weak. They attack the blessing. They attack the birthright. They attack the people of God always. They want to attack the plan of God. You will not go into this country. You will not move forward. You will not be the people of promise. They attack you from behind. They attack your needs, your desires. They keep hitting you. And that's why throughout Christendom, 
when we refer to the Amalekites, it's almost a symbol of sin in our life. We can't battle. The world is the world. But the flesh continues to do battle, and we have to put it to death. And many commentaries refer to the flesh of mankind in the same spirit of the Amalekites. It keeps coming at you. You keep having to battle that same sin, that same temptation, that same flesh that hits you over. And when you're tired and weak, it comes at you strong. you got to put it to death. We take a look at the Amalekites in a spiritual implications. It is seriously the corruption of sin. How sin affects our lives, our families, our workplaces, our marriages, our relationships. It devastates us. But not just the corruption of sin, it deals with what God says about sin that He will judge it. And we come to this judgment of God. Kill them all. Does it shock you? Does it alarm you that God says kill them all? If we read it or as I'm preaching it, Do you experience shock in the story that God says, kill every man, woman, child, and infant? Does that not draw you back and say, what? It should. Make no mistake, the passage is used repeatedly to discount the the idea that God could exist and just as significantly why anyone who believes in a God of the Bible can excuse his actions here. It comes at us and at us, and as we read it, we cannot escape it. You can't try to think your way around it. You can't say, well, that's not really what it says. That is what it says. It says it multiple times. Kill them all. We love to be able to play analytical, critical analysis games with this text because it causes me serious trouble to think that God would wipe an entire people group out. But God doesn't give them an option of negotiation. He says, go on, destroy everything. So what do you do? How do you handle this passage? written many articles on this in the last couple of weeks, and I've thought through it very heavily. And I decided I'd go through it with four different responses. So walk with me, if you would, through these mental gymnastics of, of how to respond. One is just philosophically. And if you're having a conversation with someone who's not saved, not a person who even believes in the Word, They will come at you with this, how can you serve a God that does this? And they want to set the parameters and the rules of the conversation. Philosophically, if you take God out of it, they set the rules, and you can't let them set the rules. If that's the premise of the conversation across the board, and the way you handle this this battle back and forth, it doesn't go very far. Because God, because God, and, and all this... They're not going to change their mind. You'll get nowhere with it. I've tried. Let me tell you, it doesn't work. But you never let the opposing team set the ground rules for the conversation. Because it's not philosophic. This is a real happening. We have to deal with this. And so I say, okay, look, if we're talking about a God that does this, then we have to think about a theological response. Not just mental games, but if we're talking about God, that means theos. Let's have a theological response. Of course, you'd have this thing, oh, well, how could a creator, how could a God who is loving, kind, and caring do this? And somebody will have a conversation trying to apply the compartmentalization of what we have in our emotions and our attributes. I can be loving and I can be unkind. I can be patient and I can be intolerant. And they apply my humanity to God. 
Therein lies the error. Because we compartmentalize all of our attributes. Today I'm happy. Today I'm sad. Today I'm mean. Today I'm kind. No, 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 no. The attributes of God are indivisible. They are all encompassing all the time. And he alone is holy, holy, holy. And so his kindness is holy. His justice is holy. His judgment is holy. His peace is holy. He is just with no adjective. He's not socially just. He's not um, relatively morally just. He's just. And he knows. And his scales are true. And you're going to get, on the good side, you'll reap what you sow in the good, and you'll reap what you sow in the bad. The scales are just. His attributes are indivisible. He's not a pie chart. You can slice out this piece and say, oh, I don't like that attribute of God. I'm going to cast that out. You can't do it. They're all held in perfect harmony. There's no tension in God about who he is. That doesn't get very well, very far with a non-believer either. It's true. I know Christians that don't like this. I know Christians that don't want to believe in the text of the Scripture because of this. So we have to look at it. How about the biblical theological response? Let's just take a look at the context and the content of this Bible. Is this an anomaly? Him wiping out an entire people group? Is this a one-off? Is he having a bad day? He got an, an argument with the Son and the Spirit, and they're having a bad moment, so out of rage and frustration, he says, kill them all. Is that God? Well, let's take a look. This isn't even the, the biggest genocide in the Bible. Of course, genocide is a word that's being thrown around very loosely in today's news. What it is and what it isn't. And I'm not going to get political in any way, shape, or form, but let me be very clear. A nation defending itself against people who are genocidal are not committing genocide. The most humane, if you can call a war humane, telling them when they're going to hit, telling them when to leave, <laughs> to protect the citizens. I, I, I was telling June the other day, we were talking about this, and I said I heard a story of a brigadier general who's a war historian who says he's never heard of, read of any war in history that the force would give such humanity to the opposing army or to the opposing people. Everything that can be done will be done. War is ugly. But to call this attack on Palestine genocide is a lie and it's foolishness. Okay, you can. I'll get all the text and emails later. It's fine. But let's take a look. This isn't even the biggest genocide in the Bible. Have you heard of the flood? Eight people spared out of all humanity because God judged them because of their corruption and he almost repented of even making man. He didn't like the idea of making man. And yet he created a redemption plan. On the context of this, we read over and over and over that these people continue to attack God's people and the plan. And it wasn't just an, the first interaction with Israel, but it went on and on. And they're all violent and they're all instigated by the Amalekites. His response is, I'm looking at this promise that I've made to the people of Israel, and he has to view it as an existential threat. Not simply to Israel. But the covenant of the coming Messiah. That God will bless the whole world through his chosen people, through the coming of Christ, so the sins of mankind could be abolished. That was at stake with the Amalekites trying to wipe out Israel. And you're not going to get in the way of God's plans. You can look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Nineveh. One more genocide, if you want to call it that word. The final judgment. 
You read in Revelation that God will raise all from the dead and they'll stand before him in the great white judgment and they will be judged according to their works. And be, at that point, it's already separated. The people who love the Lord have always been, already been looked at and received. But now all the dead will stand before him in judgment. Well, I don't like that, God. That's a mean God. This judgment from the Old Testament or eschatological judgment intrusions. Judgment events that break into history at certain times, but they're a precursor to the judgment of sin at the end. Sin will get you. It continues to attack you. And God has an answer for it. We put sin to death. Well, it's hard. And even preaching that and speaking of it is hard. So then I have to take a look at it. And let me do this briefly as we close this from a pastor's point of view. A grieving pastor's point of view and trying to say, Lord, what are you doing here? And it all points to the idea that God's plan for the redemption of mankind through this people and through Christ is going to point me to the cross. Christ is the answer to all of the sin that would destroy every one of us. He is the easy, the, 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 the redeeming from the judgment that will fall upon sin. And this, the cross is beautiful. So I think about this and says, okay, Lord. How do I look at it? And today, you've been harmed in your life, haven't you? Yeah. You had people that really hurt you hard, hurt you bad, haven't you? Yeah. You see in the world people who are doing evil things, don't you? Yeah. Do you want justice served? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They hurt me. Lord, vengeance is yours, but I, I pray that you bring your vengeance. <laughs> Those people who are evil and doing evil things, you pray that when they come to the courts, they get theirs because, goodness, if you killed a child, raped a girl, brutal, murdered people, do, is there no justice? Now let them go. Let them free. Let them walk. And we all just go, no, that's not right. There's no justice there. We want justice served. Unless it's us. Unless it's me. I want mercy. I don't want the justice that should be upon me. I can't handle that. Woe is me, I'm a sinful man. Please don't throw justice on me, Lord. I need your mercy. But that guy... And indeed, we look at it and says, in the end, justice must be served. Thomas Jefferson says, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. And in looking at this and seeing the sins of another and wanting justice and seeing the sins of myself and wanting mercy... And seeing how God is going to handle sin. I need to start taking sin seriously. The church has got to begin taking a look at the sins that God is calling us away from to move towards purity. And start taking them seriously. We would never expect a non-Christian to take the sin of the Amalekites seriously. How they could see how God would be just in wiping them out. And how can we ever do that if we don't even take our own sins seriously? That God would have judgment on us. God's so good, I can continue to do these sinful things because God is so good. 
No, you can't. You cannot. You're not reading the same Bible that is written by the hands of God through the people he gave this message to. And so all that you hear in the church and all you hear in the world that has to refer to God and all of this, do a little assignment and say, how do they view this book? Do they still think this is the inspired, inherent word of God? And if they don't, it's a free-for-all. It's going on in the Methodist Church, the Episcopalian Church right now. It's a free-for-all. And why? They don't believe the book. If you believe that God has put this as a special revelation, and I certainly do, how I, I can't get away from it, historically and thematically and contextually and how the prophecies are fulfilled and how it flows together by God's divine nature with one thematic message. I can't get away from it. And so I look at it and I got to start taking sin seriously. When it comes to it, can we put our own sin to death? We can't. But we know that Christ on the cross covered for sin. And after that, he says that with the God's power and by his grace and because of the cross, we can deal with our sin. This major threat. We can't give it any oxygen or it'll take you over. It's like the Terminator 2. It just keeps coming back. Charles Spurgeon said, all the goodness I have within me is totally from the Lord alone. When I sin, it's from me, and it's done on my own. But when I act righteously, it's wholly and completely of God. Colossians 3 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Judgment is coming. Praise God, Jesus took our judgment. You can't win the battle of sin in your life that attacks you over and over again without the cross of Christ. He took the judgment. Second Corinthians says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The truly obedient king, not like Saul who didn't finish the deal to put them down. Jesus finished it with all sin of all people over all time. It's on the cross. And that is an extinction judgment of sin and its power. That in Christ, sin is put to death and judgment is no longer there. And I see Moses at the battle. We're obedient. Lord, they hit us. They took us out. Take aside some men and fight them off. And as long as you're worshiping me, as long as your hands are looking to me and your face is looking to me, I'll give you victory. The same is true here. The high priest of Jesus took on the sins of man. And Hebrews 5 says, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God the high priest. As Christ lifts you up, and you're obedient to him, and saying, I'll walk in purity. In that lies the victory. Not just the fact that he covered your sin, but that you're obedient to follow him in purity. Put sin to death. First Peter says, He who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Friend, Sin attacks your blessing and your birthright. 
Sin attacks you because you are the people of God. Sin attacks you because God has a plan and a promise for your life. It attacks you from your from behind. It looks at your past and says, I'm going to hit you, and you're going to remember your past and all your sins, and I'm going to throw it in your face, and I'm going to battle you. It hits you when you're weak. Sin attacks you at your needs, your desires. And you've got to remember the judgment is real. But the price has been paid on the cross. I remind you in closing that the key figure and the key aim of Exodus is God is the key figure. And the aim is that He alone will receive glory. It's not going anywhere else. We need to give glory to God, our hands lifted up, receiving the beauty of His sacrifice that we might have victory. And I close with this verse in Romans 9. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let us grieve over the judgment that is coming, and let us glory over the redemption that we have in Christ. Father, we come before you, difficult passage, but it doesn't stand alone. It's thematic of that which would destroy us. And how you love us so much that you will do the battle so the thing that would destroy us will be destroyed. Thank you, Jesus, that on the cross you covered all of it that it is paid for. And as we come to you in relationship, lifting our hands to you to worship you, accepting your priesthood and walking in the purity you call us to, Lord, we're saved only by your grace, not through our works, but you call us to a life putting to death the flesh and allowing the Spirit to grow your fruit in us and your manner. Help us to be obedient to that, knowing that we've been saved from judgment that's coming. And it is coming. And Lord, may we grieve for those who don't know your love. May we call out to tell them, come back, come to Jesus, come to the one who loves you. Come to the one who's going to who has paid the price for your judge, the judgment, who gives deliverance over that sin that's besetting you. Oh, Lord, we grieve over them. We thank you for the patience you've shown. And we know that your day is coming when the books are closed and judgment will be given. Oh, let those we love respond to your love before that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, friends, it's Mother's Day. We'll celebrate that together. And I'm looking forward to being here with you on that day. Uh, pray for me, if you would. June and I are heading down to Vancouver this afternoon uh, to spend some time with my grandson and daughter and son-in-law. But then I drive down onto Salem to, be, uh, to moderate the convention trustees uh, meeting that's taking place on Monday. And pray for wisdom and guidance uh, in, in that I'm, a, I'm humbled to uh, be in that position. I'm a little bit trepidatious about the role itself, and I, I want the Lord to be glorified in that entire meeting. So pray for me for wisdom. That would be Monday. Uh, friends, thank you for joining us online. There's a way to give if you're so inclined. Give generously as the Lord would guide you. Uh, body of Christ, we, we give uh, graciously, regularly, as the Lord compels you. It's not by compulsion but it's by his word to say, hey, be a cheerful giver. And as you give, 
uh, the Lord bless you. And there's a way to give in the back. If you give by check, there's a box, and there's a QR code if you give by your little electronic phone thing. God bless you. Would you stand with me, friends? You're going to go out into a rainy day, but you're still called to be an ambassador. So what? Be a good one.